On July 5th, 1904, the New York Times wrote, quote, In the number of its victims, the terrible wreck of the Danish steamer Norge, off the coast of the stormy Hebrides, comes near to that of the General Slocum in the placid waters of the East River. No disaster so extensive has happened on the high seas for many years to remind men that there remains perils of the deep which human science has not yet succeeded in completely dispelling. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story? The Terrible Toll of the Norge. Here we are. Enjoy! The ship that would eventually be known as the Norge was initially launched as the Peter de Koninck in 1881. The 3,310 ton iron screw steamer had started life traveling between Antwerp and New York before being sold in 1889 to a company in Copenhagen and being renamed the Norge. Under this new name, she continued her journeys to New York, this time traveling between Copenhagen and New York. In 1898, the ship was sold to another company based in Copenhagen, this time the Scandinavia American Line, but her route did not change. The ship was kept busy as an immigrant ship, carrying people who were eager to move from Europe to the United States. The Norge's career was not without incident. Shortly before the Norge was sold in 1898, she had a collision with a French fishing vessel named La Coquette, which sank alarmingly fast. It had been a foggy day, and according to the captain of the Norge, the La Coquette was traveling too fast for the conditions. The actions of the Norge were called into question as well, though, when the captain admitted that, with the story of La Bergogna in mind, when he realized he was about to ram the other ship, he directed full speed, feeling that ramming the fishing vessel at full speed would minimize the damage to his ship. The fishing vessel sinking so fast claimed the lives of 16 of the fishermen, with the nine survivors having grabbed a hold of the anchor chains of the steamship before it pulled away. It was probably not an accident that only months after this incident, the Norge found new owners. On the 2nd of June, 1904, the Norge departed from Copenhagen with about 700 emigrants on board, all taking advantage of the low cost of fares that were now available for passage on emigrant ships. By this time, the Norge had the dubious honor of being the oldest Danish transatlantic steam running, and she primarily attracted a passenger list full of poor immigrant families. Copenhagen was a major hub, and so the people who boarded the ship were from many places. The majority of the passengers were said to be from Norway and Russia, with the remainder being from Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. Many of the passengers were traveling with prepaid tickets, provided to them by friends and family. In addition to the passengers, the Norge also carried a crew of 71, under the command of Captain Gondel. Captain Gondel had only been a captain for four years, but he had a good reputation, having worked his way up from common sailor purely through merit. Later, there would be a great interest by the public in the accounts of the voyage, but there really does not seem to have been anything of interest about the voyage until the 28th of June, at about 7.45 in the morning, when a terrible shudder ran through the ship. Captain Gondel would tell the papers that he thought they were about 18 miles from Rockall, a large rock that was a known navigational hazard but it would later be suggested that the Norge was much closer than 18 miles. Rockall has a rocky reef that is connected to it that goes on for some miles, but not so far as 18 miles away. The Norge was traveling at full speed, in spite of the hazy weather, when it suddenly struck a submerged rock that no one on board had realized was there, 
until the terrible moment when the collision suddenly knocked over everyone who had been standing on the ship. Many of the passengers were still in their berths, or were just getting ready for the day when the ship struck. A second shudder would run through the ship soon after, which for many of the passengers was all they needed to tell them that the ship had definitely struck something, and they were in danger. Captain Gondell was standing at the bridge when the ship struck, as was his first officer. As soon as the ship struck, the engines were reversed, and the carpenter checked to see how much water they had taken on. He came back with alarming news. They had already taken on five feet of water, and it was clear to everyone that the ship was not going to stay afloat for long. Captain Gondell gave the order for the pumps to be put to work, to delay the inevitable for as long as possible, and in the meantime, he ordered the passengers to put on life belts and for the ship's eight lifeboats to be prepared. A trawler had passed them about an hour before, and Captain Gondell hoped they would meet them again, and his lifeboats being hung over the side of the ship might alert the other vessel that the Norge was sinking. If this did not work, he hoped that he would be able to reach land and beach his sinking ship. That seems like a very unlikely option, since the ship hit the rock at an estimated 150 miles from land. The lifebelts were distributed, but many of the passengers reported that their strings were rotted, so they were of no use. The eight boats were never going to be enough for everyone to escape the sinking ship. Some of the boats were considered overloaded with 28 people on board, and the ship was carrying close to 800 people, including the crew. The number of boats was reduced quickly, as the boats were launched under the watchful eye of the first officer, though three of them smashed against the side of the ship and filled with water or sank under the weight of panicked passengers jumping into them. There would be a few initial allegations that the crew had acted cowardly or panicked, but later reports, both from the crew and the passengers, quickly came to the crew's defense and protested that the crew had acted calmly and nobly after the initial shock had worn off prioritizing the safety of the passengers, especially the women and children. The crew not trying to save themselves might have been a double-edged sword. In some cases, the boats were launched with no knowledgeable sailors on board, and it was alleged by some that this is one of the reasons that three of the boats were lost as they were launched. The passengers were agreed to have been far less calm. Part of the problem was a large number of families that were traveling, and many of the families got separated in the confusion, leading to panicked parents rushing around trying to find lost children. There was also the problem of the language barrier. A majority of the crew spoke Danish, but a majority of the passengers did not, adding to the confusion from the passengers. There had also been a lack of evacuation practice on the voyage. A sailor who had joined the ship for the first time on this voyage said that when a fire drill was called after the collision, he had no idea what he was supposed to do. One woman who had a small child said that she had been dressing her child in their berth when the ship had struck and had quickly decided to rush for the deck. She had thrown her child into a boat and then followed after, a swift action that had saved both their lives. Another passenger had been lying in his bunk waiting for breakfast when the shutter had run through the ship and he had immediately grabbed a few of his things and also thrown himself into one of the boats. One of the ship's engineers, a man named Jans Janssen, on learning the extent of the damage, went below to find some relatives who were on board. He escorted his relatives, as well as the passengers who were near them, into a boat, and then calmly told them that he needed to return to his post. He returned to the engine room and was never seen again. Desperate people began to jump into the sea as the ship sank rapidly, in spite of the poor conditions of the life belts they had been given. Soon the water around the ship was a writhing mass of desperate humanity. 
Captain Gondal made no effort to leave the bridge of his sinking ship, but instead decided to remain in place for what little comfort that could offer those who remained on board of her. Though, at least one person would later say that the captain looked as though he was in shock rather than calm. Captain Gondel was not willing to have his first officer, who had helped launch the five remaining boats, remain on board the ship as well, though, as it went down, and he told the mate to jump into the water and try to save himself. The first mate did jump, but Captain Gondel never saw him again. The second mate and the third mate had each taken charge of a boat, but the third mate's boat was very heavily loaded, to the extent of it being alarming. Not being willing to load down the boat, and seeing another boat that was not full nearby, the third mate swam for it. Unfortunately, he was still wearing all of his clothing which weighed him down, and he sank before anyone could save him. Since, for the most part, the priority had been saving the passengers, this left only the single sailor who had just joined the ship that voyage in charge of seeing to it that the boat reached safety. As the boat had been lowered, a hole had been knocked into it, and the people on board of it had to take turns bailing. There were a couple of oars in the boat as well as a sail, but nothing that could be used as a mast, and so they allowed the boat to drift as they bailed, hoping that they would be saved soon. Eventually, they tied a jack to an oar as a makeshift sail to aid them in their travels. To add to the concerns of the people in the boat, when they examined the water cask on their boat, they found that there was not a drop of water in it. There was some ship's biscuit, but this was eaten within the first day after the shipwreck, with no thought of rationing them. The people on the second mate's boat had more forethought. They restricted themselves to three pieces of biscuit and a spoonful of water each day. Fifteen people had gotten into that boat and then cut the tackle when it was still twenty feet above the sea in their desperation to escape the sinking ship. They would pick up four other men after the boat had reached the sea. Two of them were men who were swimming, and another was the ship's purser who had jumped from the ship's bridge into the water next to them after they had launched. They did not say how they had come to pick up the fourth man. Initially, they had not had any provisions at all, but after they had met with two other boats, some biscuit and water was shared with them. The second mate then directed their course towards Iona Island, but the sea became so heavy they were afraid that in trying to land there they would be smashed. They instead headed towards the Orkneys. The longest it is estimated that it took the Norse to sink was 20 minutes, with some people placing it around 12 minutes instead. Captain Gondel did indeed go down with his ship, still standing on the bridge, and his right leg was jammed in the process, hurting it badly, but somehow he still reached the surface again. For about 20 minutes, he swam until he came across the ship's second engineer, a man named Brun, who was a very good swimmer. The two men swam for about an hour and a half when they came across a boat, this one under the command of a passenger named Carl Henderson. Carl Henderson had managed to make it to the boat with his whole family, consisting of his wife, two daughters, and a son. This was the last boat to have been launched, and it was as dangerously overloaded as the other boats had been. Henderson had been doing his best to keep everyone else from boarding it no matter how desperate they were, because he was afraid that they would all sink under the weight. Henderson was in a difficult position, though. He was a passenger, but had at one time been a sailor, and he proved to be the only one on the boat with any experience at sea whatsoever. The boat had oars, and Henderson had tried to show the other people on the boat how to use them, but as he put it, quote, it is hard for a man with an oar in his hand for the first time to row in a heavy sea. When Henderson saw two more men swimming towards his boat, his first instinct was to drive them away from his overly full boat as well. But then one of the men identified himself as Captain Gondel. Deciding that some experienced help would help with their chances more than it would weigh them down, Henderson welcomed the two men on board the boat, and Captain Gondel took charge of it. 
This did prove a good decision because Captain Gondel soon had the boats sail up and had them heading east. Unfortunately, like the other boats, the boat they were on was painfully undersupplied. Henderson's son would not survive to reach shore again, and the former sailor was forced to bury his child at sea. Three of the boats managed to stick together for a short time, but they would eventually be scattered from each other, and each boat had no way of knowing if the other boats were even still afloat. The first boat to successfully be launched, the boat that had been launched by the second officer, wasn't even sure if more than two boats had escaped the sinking Norge. This was also the first boat to be found. The second engineer of the fishing trawler Sylvia would say that he had initially believed that he was seeing a boy that was out of place when he saw a jacket fluttering in the wind and realized it was a boat of people who had been shipwrecked. About 24 hours after the sinking of the Norge, the first people to be rescued were pulled on board of the Sylvia, most of them in very rough condition after their ordeal. They could not say whether or not there were any other survivors. But the captain of the Sylvia ordered his ship to go to the site of the wreck, hoping that they could find anyone to save. Unfortunately, all that met their eyes was no sign of the ship, but the horror of the remains of over a hundred people still floating on the water. They turned back to land. The Sylvia returned to her home port of Grimsby with the 27 survivors on board, 19 men, 6 women, and a little girl. The newspapers and authorities all rushed to find out what had happened, no easy task since very few of the survivors spoke English. The survivors were also not able to land immediately for immigration reasons. There was no Danish consul near Grimsby, but this was soon sorted out and they were brought on shore, where they were able to receive medical attention, and the people of the Grimsby did everything they could to make them comfortable. With a story that was told by the people on that first boat, it was feared by many that they would prove to be the only survivors. Captain Gondel had steered the boat that he had command of towards St. Kilda, even though he knew it was 150 miles away and they had hardly any provisions. Several times during their voyage, they saw ships pass them and they tried to attract their attention by waving a flag made from a blanket, but they failed to get any attention. The boat he was in had 28 children on it, and just as on the other boat, it was the children who suffered the most. They could see St. Kilda after about five days at sea, but the day before they reached their goal, one of the children succumbed to the lack of food and shelter. Fortunately for the others in the boat, before they could even reach St. Kilda, the steamer Energy spotted them and took them on board. The Energy brought the 39 survivors to Stornoway, where two more of the children would also succumb in the hospital. Many of the people from Captain Gondel's boat would be hospitalized, including Henderson's wife and daughters. Around the time that the energy was arriving at Stornoway, the steamship, the Servona, landed 32 more survivors of the Norge at the same port. They had been picked up near the butt of Lewis. News came from Aberdeen that the steam fishing vessel the Rattray Bay had brought in 17 more survivors. This group had survived for six days on 34 biscuits and six buckets of water. Some of these survivors were in such weak conditions that they had to receive emergency medical attention at the nearby fish market before they could be moved to a better location. The last boat to be rescued was the one under the command of the second mate. They rowed for eight days and almost made it to the Shetland Islands before they fell in with a Norwegian schooner that waved them down by means of a jacket attached to an oar and were picked up. The person who lifted the oar was in such rough condition that he could hardly keep their makeshift signal aloft. In total, the boat contained 11 passengers, 8 sailors, and 1 little girl of 15 months. When they were pulled on board the bark, the survivors were barely able to speak or stand, but one man, driven by thirst, immediately rushed for some dirty water that they had been used to wash potatoes, and drank it hungrily. 
This would be the last of the survivors found from the Norge. An estimated 600 or more people have been lost with the ship. For some time, ships traveling through the area would keep a careful watch, hoping for a miracle, but there would be no one else found. The confusion over who had been on board of the ship and who had survived did not help matters. The only records that the shipping company had was of the passengers whose fare had been prepaid, leaving many families in a state of doubt over whether or not their relatives and friends had been on the Norge or not. The fact that families had been scattered in the rush to the boats also added to the confusion and horror. One of the little girls who had been in the boat that had been landed in Grimsby was almost adopted out until it was found that her mother had survived on another boat. Meanwhile, an elderly man from the third mate's boat was forced to come to terms with the fact that the large family he had been separated from in the confusion was all gone, and that he had been the only one to reach safety. In a particularly poignant moment, a ship engineer out of New York, who had thought that his wife and child were traveling on the Norge and had been lost, returned from a voyage to find them waving at him from the dock. The sobbing man discovered that they had taken passage on an entirely different ship. It was never entirely determined what had led the Norse to go off course. By the course that Captain Gondel had said he had plotted, they should have been 25 miles from Rockall. Two things would be generally blamed. The first was the very strong current and the heavy seas combined with the haze. It was reported that the current could carry a ship directly into Rockall. The other thing that was blamed was the large compass variances that had been reported in the area by other captains. In the end, an inquiry found Captain Gondel innocent of any negligence, and the loss of the Norse was determined to have been a tragic accident. The Scandinavia American line would tell everyone that their safety equipment for the vessel had been entirely within reason. The Norse had six watertight compartments, though she sank too fast for them to be of any use. She had life belts. They ignored the reports of the strings being rotten. She had a normal number of passengers, and she had boats, though not enough for everyone. The Norge would be the worst peacetime shipping disaster to ever take place on the Atlantic before the Titanic would take its place several years later. The two stories have some similarities, but the glamorous Titanic would soon lead the aging and far poorer Norge to be almost entirely forgotten. The safety regulations that should have been considered after the Norge would be put in place after the Titanic, but at a truly terrible price. For more information, please see the New York Times from July 5th, 1904, or see other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.